Lesson 5.4 is logarithmic functions. So let's look at the exponential function y equals b to the x and try and find its inverse function. So if we switch x and y, we get x is equal to b to the y. And if we try and solve for y, there's not anything we can do. So to solve this problem, mathematicians created this thing called a logarithmic function, which was created specifically to be the inverse of an exponential function. So the logarithm is of the form y equals log base b to the x, where x is equal to b to the y. So your base is the same base as your exponential, but then your input and output switch. So what was originally your exponent is now the output of your logarithm, and what was originally what your output of your exponential is, is now the input to the logarithm. Our base is greater than zero and also not equal to one. And what the input of the logarithm is, is also greater than zero because the output of an exponential could never be negative. So we read this as log base b of x equals y. And then one shortcut that mathematicians use, if you have a base 10 logarithm, we write it without the 10. So that's if your exponential is 10, we just write log of x. So whenever you see log of x without a base, that is a base 10 logarithm. The domain of a logarithmic function is that the inside of the logarithm has to be strictly greater than zero because the range of an exponential is strictly greater than zero. We talked about our natural constant e. So we also have a natural logarithm, which is log base e of x, which we also have a shorthand for. We use ln x for natural log, but in French, which is what it's originally written in, natural is the adjective and it comes second. So ln stands for log base e of x, our natural log. So we can convert back and forth between these two forms. So if you have log base b of x is equal to y, then that means that b to the y is equal to x. So we can use this idea to convert back and forth between logarithmic and exponential form. If I want to convert log base 6 of 36 equals 2 into exponential form, my base is going to stay the same. So if this was a base 6, my exponential is going to be a base 6. And then my input and my output switch because they're inverses of each other. So 2 becomes the exponent and 36 becomes the output, which makes sense because 6 squared is 36. So what this question is actually asking is what do I have to raise 6 to to get 36? Well, the exponent would have to be 2. If we wanted to go the other way, so if we have 4 cubed is equal to 64, and then we want to convert that into logarithmic form, we have the same idea. So our base of our exponent becomes our base of our logarithm. We write it as like a subscript, so log base 4, and then our input and our output switch. So originally, 64 was our output. That now becomes our input of our logarithm. And 3 was our input of our exponential. It becomes the output of our logarithm. So what do I have to raise 4 to to get 64? I have to raise it to the power of 3. We can use the inverse form to help us evaluate logarithms. So for example, we have log base 1 half of 8, which is asking what power do I have to raise 1 half to to get 8? So I'm going to set this equal to x, and I'm going to switch forms into exponential form. So when I switch this into exponential form, my base stays the same. So my base of my exponent is 1 half, and then my input and my output switch. So x becomes my out in exponent, and 8 becomes my output. So what power do I have to raise 1 half to to get 8? I have to raise it to the negative 3 power. I want to cube it to make it 8 and negative to flip it over to become an integer. So the answers to this question, what power do I have to raise 1 half to to get 8? is negative 3. So go ahead and try the other three. For the first one, we have log base 2 of 2 is equal to 1, and we want to convert that into exponential form. So base stays the same, base 2, base 2, input and output switch. My 1 becomes my exponent, my 2 becomes my output. This is saying what power do I have to raise 2, 2 to get 2? Well, the first power, 2 to the first equals 2. For the next one, I have 27 to the 1 third is equal to 3 and it wants me to convert it into logarithmic form. So base stays the same, so the base of my logarithm is going to be 27. Input and output switch, my exponent becomes my answer, my output becomes the inside of the logarithm. What power do I have to raise 27 to to get 3? The 1 third power. And then the last one, if I want to evaluate log of 1 over 100, I notice that there's no base, so when there's no base, that means it's base 10. 
So my base stays the same, 10 to some power is equal to one over one, one over 100. That's what this is asking. What power do I have to raise 10 to to get one over 100? And it's the negative two power. Knowing these two functions are inverses of each other can help us with some properties. So we're gonna assume that f of x is equal to b to the x and f inverse is going to be log base b of x. And we're gonna do a composite both directions to see what happens. So when I compose f with f inverse of x, every time I see an x in b to the x, I'm going to replace it with the entire thing log base b to the x. So I get b to the power of log base b to the x. And since I know that when I compose inverses, it should simplify down to x, I know this thing should be x. So whenever you have an exponent raised to the power of a logarithm with the same base, basically those two cancel and you're left with whatever's inside that logarithm. Similarly, if I compose f inverse with f of x, every time I see an x in log base b of x, I'm going to replace it with the entire thing b to the x. So I get log base b of b to the x. And same thing, when I compose inverses, it has to simplify down to x. So those two basically cancel each other out. So whenever I have log base b of inside of that, the same base then raised to a power, those cancel each other out, and you're left with whatever is that exponent. For the next two properties, I kind of want to think of this in exponential form. So this first one is saying b to what power is equal to b, right? That's what log base b of b means. Well, we know anything to the first power is itself. So log base anything of itself is 1. Similarly, the next one says log base b of 1, which is asking b to what power is equal to 1. So what do we raise anything to and get 1? That would be 0. So now we have the property that log base b of 1 is equal to 0. So these are four properties that are good to know about logarithms. We can use inverses to help us solve these equations. Similarly to if you had like x squared is equal to 9, you could square root both sides to solve for x. Same idea here, we can switch forms to help us solve a specific equation. So if I look at this first equation, we've talked about exponential equations before where we try to get them to be the same base. There's no way I'm going to be able to easily write 27 as something base e, so I need to take a different approach. So I'm going to isolate my exponential and then use the inverse form to help me get the 3x out of the exponent. The first thing I did was I isolated the e to the x. You always want to get the exponential by itself first, so I divided both sides by 2. Now there's no easy way to get 27 over 2 to be base e, so I'm going to switch forms into logarithmic form in order to get that x out of my exponent. So I have log base e of 27 over 2 is equal to 3x, but log base e is the same thing as our natural log, so this is equivalent to log base e. So I have natural log of 27 over 2 is equal to 3x, this thing is just a number, so then I'm going to take that thing and I'm going to divide it by 3. So I end up with the natural log of 27 over 2 divided by 3. I can use a similar method to solve logarithmic equations. So I have the natural log of x plus 2 is equal to 4. So I need to get this x out of my logarithm. And so I'm going to use the inverse form of exponentials in order to do that. There's nothing attached to the outside of the logarithm. Otherwise, I would need to isolate that first. So I switched into exponential form. This is a natural log, which means it's a log base e. So my base stays the same, input and output switch. So e to the fourth is equal to x plus 2. e to the fourth is just a number. So then I subtract a 2 from both sides, and x is equal to e to the fourth minus 2. So if we look at the graph of y equals b to the x, this was the parent function we talked about earlier. So I have my horizontal asymptote 0, 1. My horizontal asymptote starts at y equals 0. Anything to the 0 power is 1. Anything to the first power is itself. So this is what our exponential function looks like. So now, keeping in mind that logarithms are the inverses of exponentials, my inputs and my outputs are switched. So if I have the point a, b in my exponential, I'm going to have the point b, a in my logarithm. So I took all of my y coordinates and I now made them my x coordinates, and all of my x coordinates and now made them my y coordinates. When we flip them, this horizontal asymptote becomes a vertical asymptote. So our logarithm has a vertical asymptote at y equals 0. At uh, the point x equals 1, it has an output of 0, and the point x equals whatever the base is, we have an output of 1. Those were the properties that we just talked about, and this is what a logarithmic function looks like. 
For the domains and ranges, we know the domain of an exponential function is all real numbers because you can plug anything into an exponent. And then we know that the outputs of an exponential function are y is greater than zero because if I raise a positive number to a power, I'm never going to get a zero or a negative number. So then going to the inverse, the, my domains and ranges switch. So my domain of an ex logarithmic function is that x must be greater than zero because again, the input is now what you get out of an exponential. So you can never get something negative or zero out of an exponential. And then my range, which represents the exponents, can be all real numbers. If we look at the function f of x equals log of x plus 1 and want to graph this using transformations, this thing has been shifted to the left one. So I set up my parent table here with my base being 10 because it doesn't write a base. So 0, 1, the base, and then my vertical asymptote 0, 1. And then I shifted all of my points to the left one, so subtracted 1 from all of my x coordinates. My vertical asymptote now becomes x equals negative 1. The point that was originally at 1, 0 is now at 0, 0. And the point that was originally at 10, 1 is now at 9, 1. The domain for this, because my vertical asymptote has been shifted to the left one, is now that x is greater than negative 1. Whenever we're finding the domain of an x logarithmic function, whatever is inside the logarithm must be strictly greater than 0. So x plus 1 is greater than 0, which means x is greater than negative 1. So this is a new domain issue as part of our list of domain issues. And then the range of a logarithmic function that doesn't have any context is always all real numbers. Now we have the graph f of x equals negative natural log of x. So graph this with transformations and then find the domain and range. So the only transformation being done to this is a reflection across the x-axis. So I had to set up my parent table again, and then I reflected all of my y-coordinates across the x-axis by multiplying them by a negative 1. My vertical asymptote is still at x equals 0. The point that was at 1, 0, because it's sitting on the x-axis, is still just sitting on the x-axis at 1, 0. And then the point that was at e1, because the base of a natural log is e, is now at e negative 1. e is about 2.7, so I graphed it right there. My vertical asymptote hasn't been shifted left or right at all, and I haven't been reflected across the y-axis, so my domain is still x is greater than 0, and then there's no context to this logarithm, so the range is always all real numbers. Now we have the function f of x equals log base 4 of x minus 2 plus 3. Graph it using transformations, and then find the domain and range. So this graph has been shifted to the right 2 and up 3, so I use my table, or you can just shift the points around because these are pretty simple. Um, so my vertical asymptote is now at x equals 2, the point that was originally at 1, 0 is now at 3, 3, and then the point that was originally at the base 4, comma 1 is now at 6, 4. So then I filled it in like that, and then the domain x minus 2 must be greater than 0, so x must be greater than 2, and the range is all real numbers. This example is talking about blood alcohol content in the bloodstream. So there's a big description of what all of that means. If you want to, you can pause the video and read that. But an example of this would be if somebody had a BAC of 0.02%, they are 1.4 times more likely to have a car accident as an individual who has not been drinking. So we call that the relative risk of an accident. And this can be modeled by the equation, the relative risk R is equal to E to the KX, where X is the percent of concentration of alcohol in the bloodstream, and K is a constant. So given that somebody with a BAC of 0.02% has a relative risk of 1.4, find the constant K in the equation. So we know the relative risk is 1.4, and the blood alcohol content, which is X, is 0.02, so I plug that in, and now if I want to solve for k, this is up in my exponent. So I want to switch forms in order to get that exponent out of the exponent. So I switched into logarithmic form, log base e is the same thing as natural log, and then input and output switch. So then my 1.4 becomes my input of my logarithm, and the 0.02k becomes my output. Now, logarithms are just numbers, so I can divide both sides by the 0.02 and solve for k. So now that we have that k value, we can use that information for our equation. So using this value of k, what is the relative risk of the concentration is 0.17%. And then that same value of k, what BAC corresponds to a relative risk of 1,000. 
And then if the law asserts that anyone with a relative risk of four or more should not have driving privileges, at what concentration of alcohol in the bloodstream should a driver be arrested and charged with a DUI? So go ahead and try those. So if we use that value for K and plug that into our function here, and then we want our BAC to be 0 0.17, so I plug that in for X, and then I just plug this the whole thing in my calculator and got that the relative risk would be 17.461. So then same idea, now we want to use that same value for K, but they give us the relative risk to be 1,000, and we want to find the BAC. So we're plugging in 1,000 for R and solving for X. So we get 1,000 is equal to E to all this in the power of natural log of 1.7 over 0.02x. So just like here when we were solving for K, we want to get that out of the exponent. So we need to switch forms. So my base stays the same, my input and output switch. So natural log of 1,000 is equal to X natural log of 1.4 over 0.02 because all of this was the exponent. So then to solve for x, I multiply both sides by 0.02 and divide by the natural log of 1.4. And so you get x is equal to 0.02 natural log of 1,000 divided by natural log of 1.4, which is 0.411%, which is an insane amount of blood alcohol, and you would probably be dead. And then the last one is a very similar setup to part C, except for now we want the relative risk to be 4 same process to solve it and you end up with 0 0.082 which is why the law is nothing above a 0 0.08 blood alcohol level. So logarithms are the inverse of exponential functions. The base of the logarithm is the same as the base of the exponential and then the output of your exponential, what it equals, is now the input of the logarithm and the exponent is now the output of the logarithm because it's asking what power do I need to raise this base to in order to get whatever this value is.